Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming again. Today, we have Vaivav Pandey from the University of Utah, and he's going to tell us about um, whether our natural embeddings of determinantal rings split or not. Vaivav. Uh, thank you, Eloisa, for the introduction. Hi. So, uh, yeah, so I'm Vaivav Pandey. I'm a fifth year graduate student at the University of Utah, working with uh, Anurag Singh, and I'll talk about this question today. Uh, are natural embeddings of determinantal ring split. So let me make an attempt to first explain what the question is, right? So um, here is the setup. Let Y and Z be matrices of indeterminants. Of sizes m by t and p by n respectively. And we let s to be the corresponding polynomial ring, right? So we have a polynomial ring in mt plus tn many variables. And I can define a group action on this polynomial ring. So I'm defining a group action by the general linear group on this polynomial ring, on this polynomial ring as follows. So I take an invertible matrix M and I want to define how it acts on the polynomial ring S. My action is K linear. So it's enough to define how it acts on the generators Y and Z. And then what you could extend it through the entire algebra, right? So the, the way my matrix acts on Y is by post multiplication by its inverse. And the way the matrix acts on Z is by pre-multiplication, right? I'm allowed to take inverse because I am in the, because the group is the general linear group. So every element has an inverse. Now notice that this action has been made so that Consider the matrix Y times Z, which is, well, which is an element of the polynomial ring S, right? What happens to the element Y times Z? Well, this gets mapped to Y M inverse M Z, which is just Y Z, right? So this action has been made in such a way so that um, the element Y Z maps to itself. And it so happens that when the field is infinite, so you don't have extra uh, invariance, then the fixed subring is exactly polynomials, is exactly the polynomial subalgebra generated by the matrix YZ. Okay. When the field is finite, there may be more invariance, uh, but we'll show that it's enough to work with infinite fields. It suffices, right? Now, <clears throat> I let X be a new matrix of invariants, a new matrix of variables. Of size M by N. Okay. What I do is I map the entries of my matrix X to the entries of the mate of the matrix Y Z. Notice that Y Z is a M by N matrix. So is X. And so it makes sense to define an entry wise map. Now this entry wise map will extend to the corresponding algebras in the natural manner. And now I should think about what the, what the kernel is. So, so far this map is subjective. What should be the kernel? Well, elements in the matrix YZ, if you want to think about the corresponding uh, uh, variety, are matrices with rank at most t, right? Because you have factored through a m by t, you factored through matrices of size t, right? It's m by t times t by n. So the product mat matrix cannot have size, cannot have rank more than t. So the size t plus one minors of x must vanish. And then you can show that this is an isomorphism. Right? So this is a way of thinking of the generic determinantal ring. So by the way, when I say the word generic determinantal ring, this is what it is. 
it's a polynomial ring modded out by a determinantal ideal. So this is a generic determinantal ring. And in this natural manner, it becomes a subring of a polynomial ring because k adjoin yz naturally sits inside the polynomial ring S. Make sense, right? And so, well, maybe this is my ring R. So what I've done now is I've made the determinantal ring sit inside the polynomial, sit inside a polynomial ring in a more or less natural manner. Hmm? And I'm calling this map phi. Okay. So this is the setup that we are working with. Now, I've, I've used the word uh, group actions and invariants and so on and so forth. But the setup as it is, as in whatever is inside the red box is independent of group actions. Okay. The ring R, the determinantal ring R is isomorphic to the K algebra generated by matrices of the form YZ just because of rank conditions. And K join uh, the algebra generated by YZ is naturally an iso, is natu naturally sits inside K join Y comma Z. So even though I've written a lot about group actions above, which I'll use later, the setup as it is, is completely independent of any group acting anywhere. So if you want, here K could be a finite field or an infinite field, even the integers Z, it doesn't matter, right? But, so this is my map fee, right? So this is, well, this, this is the natural embedding of the title, if you wish, right? And we, the question that we ask is, is the map fee split? Okay. And the reason to ask this question is very natural. Um, we'll see. Mo we'll see more about what are the implications of this map being split or not being split. Okay. So, I'm moving on. Okay. Now, so maybe I'll. So 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 I'm suppressing the determinantal ring now since it's isomorphic to that to the k algebra uh, generated by yz so we are asking if this is pure right okay first thing assume that the characteristic of the field is zero okay if the characteristic of the field is zero then the general linear group is known to be linearly reductive And when you have a linearly reductive group, uh, then the fixed subring inside the polynomial ring, this extension or this inclusion is pure. Okay, what's the conclusion so far? Determinantal rings are direct summons of polynomial rings in characteristic zero, owing to the fact that the general linear group is linearly reductive in characteristic zero. Okay, so. If you want the characteristic zero case is taken care of. So the question we'll deal more specifically today is assume that the characteristic of the field is positive, then is the map phi pure? By the way, uh, a map being pure or a map being split are two different things, generally speaking. But since we are working with finitely generated K algebras, they basically mean the same thing. And I might use these words interchangeably. Okay. So the question we ask is, is this map pure? Okay. Let's think about, let's think for a moment why one might want to ask this question. Okay. Assume that the answer to this question is in the affirmative. Assume so. If we don't know, we'll, we'll see in like half an hour. But assume that the answer to, the, to this question is in the affirmative then determinantal rings would naturally be a direct summand of a polynomial ring. And that would have a lot of implications, right? Then it will be, then you could say pretty easily that determinantal rings are F regular domains because they are just summands of F regular domains. And a lot of um, nice ring theoretic properties percolate from the over ring to direct summands, right? Direct summands of U of D's are U of D's, direct summands of normal domains are normal domains, so on and so forth. So that would be good. If phi is pure in characteristic zero, we would, you would have a quick proof that determinantal rings are a domains, along with some other implications. 
what would happen if fee was not pure? Well, if phi was not pure, we would at least know that the natural embedding of the determinantal ring inside its polynomial ring is not pure. So one might expect that, and it, this is just expect in quotes, that determinantal rings are not direct summands of any polynomial ring. The reason why that would be good is determinantal rings are known to be of pure. So suppose that, I guess I should write these things down, right? If the answer is yes, I, I realize I was speaking a lot. If the answer is yes, then it would follow as a corollary that determinantal rings are f-regular domains. By the way, these de all determinantal rings are known to be f-regular domains. Hmm? If the answer is no, you would have a family of f-regular domains which are possibly, or a family is singular, right? Which is possibly not a direct summon of any polynomial. Right? And if you think about it, not many examples of F regular domains are known, which do not split from, which are not summons of polynomial rings. I know one, which, which was the example given by Anurag Singh and Irina Swanson in 2004 of some eight dimensional hypersurface, which satisfied these, these properties. So, so my point is the answer to this question is interesting either ways. Huh? And, and I've used the word possibly here because, well, this is just one inclusion that we are checking. And, and to do all of them, you'll probably need more math, more difficult math. Huh? OK, so now let's start attacking this question. Um, let's begin with some easy, um, well, let's begin with some remarks. OK, so maybe this subalgebra, I'm calling it R, and this polynomial ring, I'm calling as S which I should write in a better handwriting or something. Okay. So if the inclusion R inside S splits, then if you take any ideal of the ring R and expand it to, to S and contract back, you get back the ideal, right? This is kind of what I was referring to. Information is preserved in direct summons. So you can go up and come down easily. Hmm? So let's, let's, let's take a small example, right? Since we are asking if some map is pure, if some map is split, let's, let's, let's look, at, look at a small example, a small easy example of some inclusion, which we want to ask is split or not. Let's say we take this example, k join x square, y square, which naturally sits inside the polynomial ring in two variables. Is this split? Well, if you want, the subring is generated by one X and Y over the polynomial ring S. So it's even a free, uh, it's e this inclusion is even free because I've given a K basis for the, for, for the generators of S as an R algebra, right? A second example, how about I take K join X square comma X, Y inside the polynomial ring kx Is this split or not? We'll come to it in a minute. Okay. Before coming to that example, let's start dealing with uh, our setup, right? So what is our setup? Let's first deal with the smallest case that's there, right? T is equal to one. So I'm taking a polynomial ring in M by N many in MN variables and I'm going mod at size two minus, right? So let's, I don't know, let's take a two by three matrix and the explanation is same for anything else. And going mod at size two minus is going mod the three size to minors that are there. Now, this ring is actually isomorphic 
to the segregate product of two polynomial rings. What is the segregate product? Well, if you have these two polynomial rings, k join two variables, two y's and k join three variables, you could look at the tensor product of those two rings, which would, which would just be k join y11, y12, z11, z12, z13, right? So this S is just a tensor product of those two polynomial rings. The segregate product is the diagonal of that. It is elements generated by degree the i the degree i i piece. So if you want the segregate product, the segregate product is generated in degree one. And what are the degree one elements of a segregate product? You take the corresponding degree one elements of both the algebras and put them together, right? So this looks like a y one one z one one, y one one z one two, y one one z one three, and y two one z one one y21, z22, y21, z23, right? So a ring mod, an ideal of size two minus is just the segregate product of two polynomial rings. And the segregate product is by definition a direct summand of this polynomial ring S. So in this case, phi splits or phi is pure, okay? Because the segregate product is just the algebra generated by the degree i, i, p. So, that, so the diagonal of the tensor and the tensor is a polynomial ring, right? So you have that. So when t is equal to one, the answer is true. And notice that this is a characteristic free argument. There's, there, there's nothing here to do with characteristics, okay? Next example. Let's take T to be two, right? That's, that's now the, more, the most difficult case. And now let's do something dumb. Let's take M and N both to be two, okay? So what am I doing here? I'm taking a polynomial ring, X11, X12, X21, X22. I'm taking a polynomial ring in two by two uh, variables, that's in four variables, and I'm going mod, it's size three minus. which is zero, right? That's okay because even then this polynomial ring is still a subring of uh, k or join yz, right? So I could write this as k or join yz11, yz12, yz21, yz22 inside k or join y comma z, where the matrix Y is size M by T, so two by two, and the matrix Z is size T by N, so two by two, right? So what do I have here? I have the I have an inclusion of the trivial determinantal ring inside a polynomial, which is okay. Is this split? Now, here, the algebra elements Y, Z, I, J, Notice that they are algebraically independent, right? right? Because the ring R, the determinantal ring has dimension four and you have exactly four generators of the polynomial algebra in, in YZ. And so the four of them must be linearly, must be algebraically independent. And when you have an algebraic, when, when your base is algebraically independent, oh, sorry, when your base is regular, so here your base is regular, right? When your base is regular, you can find out if an inclusion is pure or not by an ideal theoretic calculation, right? So here is a result of Hoxter from 77. If I'm not wrong, this paper is called cyclic purity versus purity, where if, if your base is regular, then you can put your hands on do some ideal theoretic calculation and see if uh, an inclusion is pure or not. What he says is it's enough to check cyclic purity, that is purity for ideals, is intersection R is equal to I for powers of the algebra generators. So if I simply take YZ11, 
yz12, yz21, and yz22. It's enough for me to check if the condition is intersection R is equal to I holds for this ideal and all its parts. So I want to check that when I extend this ideal in the polynomial ring S and contract back, I get exactly the same ideal. If you do not get the same ideal, what more might you get? This is a quick check that anything else that you, it suffices to check that the circle does not belong to the expansion, right? If there is something else in the expansion, then, then a multiple of it lies in the circle. So it's enough to show that the circle is not there. And why is the circle one generated? Well, because these elements are algebraically independent. So the corresponding quotients are Gorenstein and hence the circle is one generated, right? So it's enough to check this. So enough to check this for phi to be pure. Okay. It's enough just to work with this family of ideals. So that's a non-trivial result uh, from Hoxter. So assume that the circle does belong to these ideals. Okay. If it does belong, here is something you could do. You could specialize the matrix Y to the identity matrix. If this element belongs to the ideal, it must continue to belong after doing the specialization. But what do you get after doing this, after doing the specialization? After doing this specialization, all that you get is Z11, Z12, Z21, Z22 to the power K minus one belongs to Z11K, Z12K, Z21K, Z22K in the polynomial ring KZ. But we know that this is not true because I mean, I don't want to say the, the uh, uh, monomial theorem or the direct summand theorem. This is just the direct summand theorem in a polynomial ring, right? And you know that this is not true. Right. Conclusion, phi is pure. Right. So we said that we had to check an ideal theoretic condition, and that is satis and the and that is satisfied if you uh, specialize either your matrix Y or Z to the two by two identity matrix. And so you have that phi is pure. So far, whatever has happened in characteristic zero continues to happen in characteristic P. There is no difference, right? Every time the map is pure. So let's see if something changes from here on. Let, let me put another remark. So I said that we'll talk about the purity of, we'll talk if this inclusion is pure. Right. Let's see if this inclusion is pure. If this inclusion was pure, my base is R and my over ring is S. If this inclusion is pure, then R is equal to, sorry, then S is equal to R plus some something in the category of R modules, right? This is the meaning of this inclusion to split. I'm tensoring this equality with the top local cohomology of R. So I'm tensoring this with the top local cohomology of R supported at its homogeneous maximal ideal. Okay, but the top local cohomology is right exact. So this is just written as follows. Aha, but the top local cohomology of R supported at its maximal ideal is non-zero and hence this should be non-zero. 
But what is this local cohomology module? In the ring S, the ideal generated by X square XY is as good as the ideal generated by X up to radical because local cohomologies only depend on the radical of the ideal defining the support. And so this is zero. Conclusion, phi is not pure. Okay, so we used the local cohomology modules here to check if some inclusion is pure or not. And this looks like an like a easy enough example so that you could get your hands on. But if an example helps us do it, in doing some calculation, maybe it can help us in our uh, setup as well. So what is our setup? The next interesting case is T is equal to two. And I take X to be a three by three matrix. Right. So what am I doing? I'm taking the determinantal hypersurface. This is isomorphic to a matrix three by two times a two by three matrix of variables sitting inside the corresponding polynomial. Right. And I want to check if this inclusion is pure or not. Okay. What is our strategy? Our strategy is whatever we learned from this example. What did we learn? Take the homogeneous maximal ideal of R. So my ring R as a subalgebra of the polynomial ring in YZ is Y is the ideal generated by Y into Z. So we want to check that, check if So I took the homogeneous maximal ideal of R, expanded it to S, and I want to check if that local cohomology is zero or non-zero at what, uh, and what homology, cohomological index I should look at. I should look at the cohomological index, which is the dimension of the base ring, right? Because that is what is certainly non-zero in the base. And the dimension of my base is eight, right? Because it's a determinantal hypersurface of a three by three matrix. In case this is non-zero, we would have to we would have to decide think on more strategies and so on. In fact, this local cohomology being non-zero actually tells that that tells us that this inclusion is pure because the base is Gorenstein. But I don't want to get into that. But if this is zero, we would certainly know that this inclusion is not pure, and that would be striking because this inclusion is pure in characteristic zero, right? So, how would we check this? How to do this? Let's go back to the previous example. The ideal generated by X square XY became equal to the ideal generated by X up to radicals in S. What did we do here? Well, all that happened is the ideal generated by X square XY, which is the homogeneous maximal ideal of R, we, we looked at its primary decomposition in S, right? And the primary decomposition was easy enough so that the ideal became one generated and we had that things were not pure. What if I do the same thing here? By I1 YZ, I just mean entries of the matrix YZ. Look at its primaries decomposition in S. Now, as long as we understand what these uh, prime ideals are, if we have a good understanding of them, and if there's a way to understand them in for all M, for all T, and for all N, then this strategy could work, right? Then what would happen is H8 of I1, YZ in S, I could replace it with H8 of this product ideal in S. But how, how would I calculate the product of n things. Well, the one thing which could strike in your head is the meyer vitoris sequence, right? If I have enough understanding of each PI and of if we understand each PI and their sums PI plus PJ and the product of two of them taken at a time 
and if these ideals are nice enough so so assume that s mod s mod each pi is cohen macaulay since we are in characteristic p there will be only one non vanishing of local cohomology which would be at its height by uh, what is known as peskin spiro vanishing we'll assume that we know that okay so that's our strategy at least okay so 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 i want to calculate if some inclusion is pure all i said is tensor the inclusion with the top local cohomology of the base supported at its homogeneous maximal ideal and check if you you get something non zero in s right now notice that this entire calculation is happening inside a regular like regular ring which is s and by a decent enough ideal i1 of yz so we could probably get our hands on and actually do this right this this is not a bad setup the ring is regular the ideal is coming from a determinantal ideal so one could probably do this okay now what is the primary decomposition we don't know so we ask nicolet right so if you want this is a lemma and once nicolet tells us then we verify it and then we call it a theorem or whatever okay so um so here is here is the lemma right the expansion of the maximal ideal in r a maximal ideal of r in s which is just the expansion of i1 yz in s looks like this so again recall that y is a 3 by 2 matrix z is a 2 by 3 matrix right here is what the expansion of this ideal looks like it looks like so one minimal prime over it corresponds to all the variables y okay another minimal prime over it is all the z's okay it it's not difficult to check that these two are prime ideals and these two are minimal primes over the given ideal and these are kind of boring because they would behave exactly the same in characteristic 0 and characteristic p and then there is a third component which is interesting and and what it is is the following it's the size 2 minors of some matrix that matrix also is not that difficult to write down so it's y11 y21 let me okay y12 y22 y23 negative of y11 negative of y21 negative of y31 and then the matrix of c's okay so one could be bothered by what kind of matrix showed up i understand but what is this third prime well this third prime this, this third prime is just the size 2 minors of a generic matrix i know that some of the y's have been inverted and there's a negative sign but at the end of the day this is a generic matrix and if you look at all the cross terms as in the cross terms of y and z those will exactly give you the generators of y z right so y12 times z21 plus y11 times z11 is exactly the first generator of the ideal yz right so this is written in the form p1 intersection p2 intersection p3 right where p1 is the ideal of y's p2 is the ideal of z's and p3 is a 2 by 2 uh, is the size 2 minors of a 2 by 6 matrix okay why is this interesting here is why this is interesting so so what is the next step that we said we said that we will feed it into the meyer witteris sequence now i won't do the entire meyer witteris calculation but i'll at least convince you that you could go go through that path so what is the meyer witteris sequence let's recall well the meyer witteris sequence for local cohomology modules for ideals for two ideals in a polynomial ring is as follows you look at the meyer, uh, local cohomology at a plus b then at a plus that of b and then at ab and what we could do is well we could first do our meyer witteressing with p1 and p2 and then whatever we get we could meyer witteress that with p3 and hope that not many uh, local non vanishing of local cohomology modules come up so so that we can actually do the calculation right 
Now notice the following interesting things. S mod P1 is certainly Cohen Macaulay, right? Because what is S mod P1? S mod P1 is just K join Y comma Z by the ideal of Y, which is just KZ, right? Since S mod P1 is Cohen Macaulay, this means that the only non-vanishing supported at the ideal P1 is at its height. And since there are six variables, the height is six, right? So the ideal P1 is easy to deal with as is P2, right? So P1 and P2 will not give us a lot of non-vanishings so that this calculation is so far under control. Here is the interesting thing. The cohomological dimension of P3 which is just the top non-vanishing of its look of the local cohomology supported at this ideal is the is the cohomological dimension of a size of the of size two minors of a generic matrix and this is known to be interesting right in characteristic p it is just the height since the corresponding quotient is cohen macaulay in characteristic zero it is the arithmetic rank And the arithmetic rank and height of determinantal ideals is well known. What is the arithmetic rank? The minimum, minimum number of uh, uh, generators you need to define the ideal up to radical. But if you don't know that, what this expression says is just this. The, cohomologic, the cohomological dimension of determinantal ideals is as small as it can be in, in positive characteristic and as big as it can be in characteristic zero. And both these numbers are known, okay? You, like you can look up the formulas and write things down. Okay, if you want, in this case, um, yeah. So if you want, in this case, the height of P is five and the arithmetic rank is nine. Okay, so over the rationals, H9 is non-zero, but over fields of characteristic P, H9 is zero. So H9 is a delicate local cohomology module. And the fact that H9 is delicate, would give us two separate calculations over characteristic zero as compared to characteristic P. Okay. So if you so if you feed in P1, P2, and P3 in the Meyer Vettori sequence, you will get, and it's not always that knowing which local cohomology modules are zero and non-zero would give you the Meyer Vettori. A sequence will give you everything. You sometimes have to know the map. Here, there are just so few non-vanishings that you don't need to know anything. You, knowing, knowing a certain local cohomology module is zero or non-zero would give you whatever you want. So if you believe me on this, if you trust me on this, what you would get is, you would get that H8 of I1, YZ in the polynomial ring S is zero by a repeated application of the meyer vitter sequence. Okay, what, is, what, what does that mean? Coming back to the main question, phi is not pure. I'm repeating this. It means that the natural embedding of the determinantal hypersurface inside its polynomial ring in positive characteristic does not split and it splits in characteristic zero. Okay, so that's 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 interesting, right? So you have a result for vanishing of local cohomologies, which is characteristic dependent, right? So here here are some, again some remarks. When you are applying meyer vitteri sequence with two or three ideals, you need to know things like p1, p2 plus p3, right? Why am I saying all this? Well, we did one calculation, but we want it to hold for all uh, all determinantal rings, right? So we would need to understand these ideals, right? And up to radical, this is just P1. Remember that P1 was the ideal of Y's and P2 was the ideal of Z's and P3 was the two by two minor, right? This up to radical is just that. And what is P1 plus P3? P1 plus P3 is ideal of Y's plus the size two minors of Y's with Z's, if you want, with some minus signs and with some rearrangements, so on, right? Well, this is just as good as the size. This is just Y plus I to Z. 
because everything else is already absorbed in y and so the corresponding quotient is cohen macaulay right so what is s mod p1 plus p3 it's k join y comma z mod y plus i to z which is just again a determinantal ring it's interesting how determinantal rings keep quotienting back to determinantal rings it's, it's very pretty this is cohen macaulay why is it interesting that this is cohen macaulay well then p1 plus p3 would only have one non vanishing of its local cohomology modules that is at its side so all the ideals in our meyer vitoris all of them define cohen macaulay quotients something much deeper is happening which is being exhibited in one example here what is that something when well, it so happens that in no matter what type of calculation you do as in no matter which size of determinantal ring you take all the prime ideals coming and all of their sums will always be cohen macaulay when you look at the primary decomposition of the maximal ideal of r in s here is here is why so what do i want to see i want to see so so here is the main question if if we, if we can answer it we would know the proof how to find the minimal primes of i1 yz in k at join yz if you knew exact if you could get your hands on what these minimal primes are then you could probably like do all the calculations in all the case if you really know what these primes are right so what i do is i look at the corresponding variety and i take any two close points on it right so v of i1 y z is the variety defined by it and i'm taking any two points on it what is the meaning of this well the meaning of this is that a is a m by t matrix d is a t by n matrix such that their product is zero that means they define a complex right so that means i have a complex which looks like this here is the matrix b here is the matrix a right the definition of complex at kt tells us exactly that the image of the matrix b should be contained inside kernel of a right i'm writing down things in terms of dimension this means the rank of the matrix b should be less than or equal to the rank of the matrix a uh, should be less than or equal to kernel of a but by rank nullity the kernel of a is the dimension of the base minus its rank right so what do you get you get something interesting you get that the rank of a plus rank of b is less than or equal to b see this is interesting because you took two you took two random closed point in the variety defined by the ideal of interest and you saw that any two matrices there must satisfy some rank conditions and so what this will give you is that if you follow this calculation what this would give you is that let's say that the rank of a is i and the rank of b is j i have around 7 more minutes so i'll i'll finish this if the rank of a is i and the rank of b is j i1 of yz exactly looks like this it looks like so these give you the minimal components uh, the the irreducible components of the algebraic set i1 of defined by i1 of yz so if rank of a is i then the size i plus 1 minors of a must be zero and if the rank of b is j then the size j plus 1 minors of it must be zero and you have to stay in the uh, in the variety defined by i1 yz so i'm also adding that because you can't leave that variety right and these ranks could va could vary right so this rank could vary so i plus j should be less than or equal to t uh, i'm sorry i plus j should be equal to t and i should vary from 0 to t okay so i'm making uh, these these are all possible ranks right so this what this will give me is this will give me the vanishing set of i1 yz as union of primes pijs where i plus j is equal to t okay and now these pijs are well understood but probably you are listening to it for the first time so you, so you don't think that you understand this completely i'll go back to the example that we did and i'll convince you that 
this is exactly what is displayed there. This is what we got, right, up to radicals. Let's look at the ideal P00. So what is the ideal P00? The ideal P00 is, oh, I need I plus J to be equal to T. So I must look at P02. The ideal P02 is, plug things here, I1 of Y plus I3 of Z plus I1 of YZ. I1 of Y plus I3 of Z plus I1 of YZ, right? So all I did is I plugged it into this component. I plugged in I equal to zero in that component. But Z is a two by three matrix of variables. So this is anyway zero. And I1 of YZ is absorbed in the ideal of Ys. And this is exactly what we got here, right? Similarly, P20 would be I1 of Z which is exactly what we got here. The other thing, the, the third prime would be P of one comma one, which is if you want, I let's, let's, let's plug in one comma one. What do I get? I two Y plus I two Z plus I one Y Z. I two Y plus I two Z plus I one Y Z. That is the third prime that you should get. And notice that wherever I have written this thing properly, this ideal, Look at the Y part, it's I2 of Y. Look at the Z part, that's I2 of Z. Look at the cross terms, that is I1 of Y. So these primes are showing up in a very interesting manner, right? Now, it is a theorem of unity that S mod each Pij is Cohen Macaulay. And this is a very interesting calculation, which I guess this is a paper of 80s where he's used this method of called the principal radical systems, which is how the very first time it was proved that determinantal rings are Cohen-Macaulay. So Hoxwell proved that determinantal rings are Cohen-Macaulay by using something called principal radical systems. And he applied that exact same calculation into this, uh, into ideals which define projective resolutions of length two, which is exactly what is happening here. To, to, sh to show that all the ideals which show up do define Cohen-Macaulay quotients. And if you think about it, Pij plus Pi prime J prime would just be P of minimum of I and I prime and minimum of J and J prime because these ideals are coming through rank conditions. So the sum is also gives you something which is Cohen-Macaulay, right? Okay, so... How, how much time do I have? I have two minutes. The upshot of this entire thing is the following theorem. So this theorem is um, Lobster, Jack Jeffries, and Anurag Singh. So this is our theorem for for generic determinantal rings. Fix positive integers. I mean, if, uh, let, okay. The inclusion KYZ inside KY comma Z in positive characteristic is pure. Recall that Y is a M by T matrix of variables. Z is a T by N matrix of variables. So that this is the inclusion of the generic determinantal ring inside the polynomial ring wherein it naturally sits. Then phi is, phi is pure if and only if three things happen. If and only if T is one, where you are going more the size two minus and that's segregate. So that we discussed about. Or if M is less than or equal to T or if N is less than or equal to T. What is the second and third thing? When either M or N is less than T, then the size T plus one minus R zero. So that's just the inclusion of a regular ring inside another regular ring. These are the cases where the determinantal ideal is trivial, right? And we remarked that both these things, both these inclusions are regular in like 30 minutes back or so. But it turns out these are the only cases when these embeddings can be pure. So upshot determinantal rings are not direct summands of polynomial rings in, in inside which they naturally sit in. 
other than a few degenerate cases. Okay. The last remark that I would want to make is you can do the similar calculation. You can do a similar calculation for other classical families of determinantal rings. So you could copy and paste the exact same method for Fafian determinantal rings, for symmetric determinantal rings, for uh, uh, for the Grassmannians. And I'm sure I've got the spelling of Grassmannians wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> so you could do the exact same calculation for all three. And well, for some of them, I mean, here Unike helped, Unike helped us out by doing this calculation that each of these quotients are Cohen Macaulay. In other places, people might not help us out. So we might have to do, do the PRS thing by ourselves, uh, the principal radical system thing by ourselves, and show that apart from a few de degenerate cases, none of these determinantal rings are direct summons of the polynomial rings inside which they naturally set. Okay, so that's my talk. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's think Viva. Great questions. Okay, I have a question. So okay. you were just telling us um, that there's a, so in these other classical cases, um, you just said there's apart from a, a few, um, a few cases. So is it there also that in the cases where it is pure that actually it's just a regular ring or yeah. is there something more interesting happening? Well, um, it so happens that the sub examples of these rings which define toric varieties they turn out to be the ones which which are regular so for example look at the symmetric determinantal ring there'll be some symmetric determinantal ring which will just be a veronese subring of a polynomial ring and those will turn out to be cohen macaulay so um the regular ones definitely turn out to be uh, <laughs> in fact i mean in fact the, the calculation is much more subtle in the others right in fafian determinantal rings there are some regular rings which are not uh, pure inside the other regular things, rings inside which they set. And it's okay. So, so notice that K join X square XY is a regular ring sitting inside the regular ring K join XY. And so this was not pure. So for example, in the Fafian determinantal rings, you will see some examples of the trivial Fafian subalgebra not being pure subrings of the polynomial algebra inside which they set. Mm. So it, it's a little more subtle there. I guess the story was like a little more uh, I don't know, easy to communicate for these generic determinantal things that ah, things where are, it's, it kind of splits properly. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. More questions? Yeah, I might have a couple. So, all right, so, so can y'all also, so all right, so these things may not be pure. These natural embeddings into these regular rings may not be pure, but do y'all give any arguments for maybe some of these rings can't be split out of a regular ring in general? Yeah, so that is what we are thinking of, right? Um, so, so that is the expectation. The expectation mm -hmm. is, I and mean, that's the expectation. There's no, we don't know a proof of that, but we do have like some way of thinking about it. So let's okay. take the, the determinantal hypersurface. X are three by three matrix of variables, mod its determinant. We do not know if this splits from any polynomial ring. The guess is, I mean, at, at least Anurag's guess is that it doesn't. And the way we are thinking about is it is by showing that these rings do not have finite Frobenius representation type. So a certain property, which yeah, so yeah, yeah. is yep. some property Definitely. which amounts of regular rings should have. If we could show that the determinantal hypersurfaces do not have FFRT, we could show that the others also do not have FFRT because it turns out that the rectangular determinantal rings are summons of the square determinantal rings. So if you could just show it for hypersurfaces or for square determinantal rings, you could show it for everything. But showing that some ring does not have FFRT, we don't have enough tools. So, and we are wondering about it. Ah, if we could show it in some way that, I mean, see, for example, think of that uh, eight dimensional hypersurface uh, example of Anurag and uh, Irina, the way they showed that that is not a direct amount of any regular ring was by so showing that it has infinitely many associated primes. We, you won't really expect that to work here, right? So you'll yeah. probably have to think of something else, but the answer is we do not know. I mean, okay. if you have some way which we could try out, we'll, we'll try it out. And then um, let me make sure I understand what's going on here. Well, inside the theorem itself. 
Um, right, so you're saying phi can only be pure if and only if, right, the determinate, determinantal ideal is trivial, meaning you're just taking two large minors, is what you're saying? Correct. All right, Correct. so that's it. So that's interesting. So, but, okay. And so the question I have then also yeah. to show that when you are doing something non-trivial, right? So what, it, it looks like you're, are you doing what you did in the examples, which is you only base change by the top local cohomology module and force that to not be injective otherwise? Yes, correct. And, so, and it works out. Okay, so y'all completely get, get around having to base change by the injective hole in the non-going state radius. Yes. Or tensor with the injective. Okay, that's great, because that would be a nightmare. That's yeah. great. Yeah, right, I mean, but the example that we did was a Gorenstein base. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but but the point is in the non-Gorenstein case as well, you're not only is it not pure, you're saying, but it's actually this specific module. When you tensor with this, you get something non-injective. And it's the top local cohomology. Yeah. So and that's and that's interesting, right? You so 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 here is something which comes to mind. Um, you you know what solid subrings are, right? Mm -hmm. A subring R inside S is solid if this Hall module is non-zero, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but when things are nice, when you are sitting inside uh, like a uh, regular domain, when you are sitting inside complete domains, this mm -hmm. is as good as verifying this. Because of local duality, huh? So what, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what so, we are showing here is that the determinantal rings are not even solid subrings of the polynomial rings inside which they naturally yeah, it's a nicer result. That's a nicer result. That's kind of cool. I like yeah. it. That's good. Okay. I feel like I had one other question, but that, yeah, yeah, please. I think this is a good way to end my questions. I like that. That's nice. That's very good. And you can always ask more questions during tea. <laughs> it might come to mind. So maybe on that note, this is maybe a good good time to to thank Viva again. Thank you. Thank you so much.